today's talk is um, something that's, you know, I probably get more requests for, for this than just about anything. And not, and not just addiction information, but uh, secular counseling information. People that need, whether it's addiction counseling or mental health counseling and looking for one that's not uh, Christian-based can sometimes be a challenge. Um, Megan is, um, uh, she's a physician, and this is Dr. Megan Way here in front. She's a physician. She's a board-certified anesthesiologist practicing here in the DFW area since 2008. Uh, she started her career in academics at UT Southwestern, going into private practice in 2012. Um, she received her master's degree um, in healthcare administration in 2013 and has served as the chief of anesthesia at several facilities with a focus on pain management and patient safety. Over this past year, she's shifted gears and is pursuing her new passion, is currently working toward her board certification in addiction medicine. Uh, she'll be serving as the medical director of a new outpatient addi addiction treatment center in DeSoto called Clean, State, Clean Slate, and that begins for her in December. Um, so Megan's going to come up and talk about that. She's going to share some of her personal story. Um, you know, on, on a side note, you know, Ma Megan is... is, is her and her family, her husband Jeremy, and their children are beloved community members, and uh, many of us here um, count them, uh, her, her and her husband, amongst our closest friends. Um, it was hard to watch what was going on in her life, um, but it's been fun to watch her pick those pieces up and do so well with it, and so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, her sharing her story with you. Um, to share a little peace of mind, I went, I went through uh, in a Narcotics Anonymous back, I don't know, it was maybe 35 years ago. It was a long, long time ago. And I was young. I was like 18. And I got hung up on one of the first couple of steps where they go into the higher power thing, right? And I simply could not get over it. And I remember the guy that was running things said, well, he finally decided after arguing with me that I needed to select a tree as my higher power. And I was supposed to hand off all my problems to a tree, you know, and the thing was court mandated, so I gave all my problems to a tree. And but the whole thing is ridiculous. The larger point being is that if you if you are a non-believer, it can be tough to get through uh, some of the programs that are out there. So uh, I'm looking forward to hear what Megan has to say about it, and look forward there'll be some opportunity for you to uh, have some discussion, and ask some questions afterwards. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, Dr. Megan Way. That poor tree. All right. Good morning. So um, please forgive me, but it has been a long time since I've you know gotten up in front of people and talked, and certainly not about something um, you know uh, that has been so personal for me. Um, So this is um, this is a really tough topic, addiction um, and recovery, uh, specifically because it's often so personal um, for each of us. Um, I think everybody knows uh, how much of a problem addiction is in our um, country, um, but just in case you missed it, uh, drugs now kill uh, more people than cars, than guns, um, roughly 78 people a day die, um, and it's estimated that uh, 20 million Americans um, have a current substance use disorder. So if you factor in, you know, not just the people with the actual substance use disorder, but all of the family and loved ones, you know, and friends that are affected, I mean, that's just a huge number of people that are affected. Um, and the results can be devastating. Um, so. I'm going to ask for some latitude. I'm going to try to cover, you know, as much of this really broad topic as I can um, in, you know, as non-judgmental way as possible. I'm going to share some of my own personal experiences and try to tie some of that in. Um, but obviously, when we have like 30 minutes is not going to be a sufficient amount of time to cover everything. <laughs> okay, so. Let's see here. 
All right. So this is basically what we're going to try to talk about. Um, I'm going to try to hit some of the highlights and just give you know some broad overviews, and then specifically um, tie in like our current understanding of what we know about addiction and how that affects treatment. Um, and then we're going to talk about some of the you know more specific secular issues that I think probably a lot of people. It's the reason that you came out today. Um, and then, of course, I'll try not to get too much onto my soapbox, you know, but from a political and socio, you know, economic kind of standpoint, there's a lot that we can do better. So we'll talk about that at the end as well. <laughs> so I put up this picture um, because, uh, you know, that's my family. And um, there's some discord, I think, when people, you know, see me or, you know, see pictures like this. Um, I'm going to just be pretty frank about what happened, but um, I am a recovering drug addict. Uh, and I will never forget uh, going into a treatment center. I was malnourished. You know, I was hectic and wasted and anemic and I was severely ill and I was an emotional wreck and um, you know I go in to meet the therapist and it's this very well-dressed but kind of grizzled you know gnarly old man and kind of looks at me and he says so what brings a nice young lady like you into a place like this <laughs> and that's the question right I mean, I, you know, by all accounts, I'm a very normal, well-off person, um, you know, have a great career and, you know, beautiful children and all of these things going for my life. And yet somehow I ended up as, you know, a drug addict um, who, you know, could barely function. I mean, it was so bad. Um so, you know, that's, and that's the question that, you know, every addict and their family and their loved ones face is how in the hell did this happen? Uh, that story, I'll bring up little pieces of it as we go through. Okay. So back to the beginning. Drugs have been around for a really long time. <laughs> um, since uh, basically recorded history. Uh, mind, body, and mood altering substances. Um, and our understanding of the use and um, the value of these substances has obviously changed significantly throughout time um, and is influenced by both culture um, and, you know, all of the things that tell us when to use these, you know, when these can be appropriate for use. So if you're, you know, in a culture um, like the American Indians, you know, uh, mind-altering substances have their own specific and unique purpose um, versus, you know, other cultures where um, they're more for relaxation or uh, all sorts of different reasons. Um, historically, though, uh, imbibing has um, generally been socially acceptable. It's a great way to pass the time when you didn't have anything else to do. Um, but typically, uh, intoxication um, or inebriation has been frowned upon. And in our society, particularly, it's often been sort of demonized, um, and uh, that plays a uh, has played a, a big part in how we view um, addiction. Um, but in the past, uh, we didn't often see the level of addiction that we do now because uh, of access. So, um, you know, you had alcohol and you had opium, um, but we certainly didn't have fentanyl. Uh, or methamphetamines or propofol. Um, so that played a big um, part in um, why we're seeing it as such a problem now. So uh, throughout history, there's been lots of different viewpoints um, and understanding of addiction. Um, in the past, like in the 1800s, um, it was basically the moral, temperance, and criminal models. Um, so it was just basically believed to be, you know, either a lack of willpower, um, deviant behavior, or even just criminal behavior. Um, people who couldn't handle their liquor or, <laughs> you know, became, used substances to excess. 
um, you know, it was just an aberration. Uh, and, um, you know, we would take those people, depending on your affluence and your, you know, uh, the resources that you had available, you were either, you know, quietly taken care of by your friend, your family, um, or you were locked up in an asylum and just, you know, tossed away. Um, there really wasn't a whole lot of uh, things that we we did um, for these people other than that. Um, but basically, as the um, industrial age came upon, those family and social ties were weakened, and so you know, people were more and more developing. Uh, addiction, and we had less ways to control it. Um, and this is about the time uh, that this, the disease models started popping up. So people are kind of going, okay, maybe there's something else going on here. And right around the time of uh, the end of prohibition is when um, these disease models started popping up. Um, and they still, you know, continue today. Uh, and a lot of uh, our understanding about the biology of um, addiction and, and substance use comes from that. Um, there is a uh, really great book by Johan Hari called Chasing the Scream, that if anybody's interested in, you know, reviewing kind of the past 100 years, um, you know, of how our society has, uh, how all these, you know, forces have interplayed in the way that we view addiction um, and drug use. That's a great book. He has a lot of, he has some TED Talks, too, that are really good. All right. So, um, basically what we understand now is that addiction is a spectrum disorder. Um, medically speaking, uh, it's, you know, it's true that you can't become an addict uh, if you never use drugs. And so that often becomes, you know, the tagline is just don't do it. <laughs> but as we've seen from, you know, recorded history, drugs are here. They're not going anywhere. People are going to use them. Um, so, you know, it, we try to look at it things, um, you know, in phases of use, basically. So while it's true that you can't become an addict um, if you don't use drugs, or then, um, the opposite is not true, though. Not everyone who uses drugs becomes an addict. Um, so for most people, I wish I had like a little pointer, but for most people, you know, we uh, use drugs and either socially, recreationally, or even sometimes into the more moderate use, um, but we never move on into that um, chronic, compulsive, or chaotic phase um, where we start to see addiction develop. Um, and so our understanding of why this develops um, and in who it develops um, has grown significantly. Uh, okay, I don't know how to yeah. <laughs> Never mind. Um, uh, but basically, so, so the, the key I, I want people to take away from this is that there's a difference between substance use or misuse and addiction, okay? So oftentimes, you know, especially with young people, um, there's some experimentation that happens or we wanna try it, you know, out and see what it's like. That is not addiction, <laughs> okay? Um, and it does not need the level of treatment, you know, that someone with uh, an addiction issue has. This is also where a lot of the confusion comes up with, you know, people who are like, oh yeah, I was addicted to blank, fill in the blank, methamphetamines or whatever. Um, but, you know, I just stopped. And it was fine. It kind of sucked for a couple of days, and then I went on about my business. That is not addiction, <laughs> okay? If you can just stop <laughs> and go on with your life, then you don't have an addiction issue. You may have had, um, you know, a substance abuse issue or misuse issue, and it got kind of out of hand, and you started feeling some of the biological effects of it. Um, but, you know, that's different than um, what we see with people who... Uh, can't stop, um, and it's on the next slide. It's regardless of harm, yeah. So continued use despite harm. And now we know, you know, I'll go over this a little bit later, but there's a lot of different factors that go into the development and the treatment of addiction. Um, but the hallmark is loss of control. So um, with addiction, people lose control of their substance use, 
and then they lose control of their lives due to that substance abuse. Okay. Um, and, and this is the key difference. And this is where, you know, we get into that confusion area because like I said, some people, you can still have some of the effects of drug use or abuse without having actual addiction. Okay. So, mm -hmm. the favored model today, I'm kind of jumping around, but the favored model today is um, basically incorporates a lot of the old models. So we have the, you know, disease model and we have these psychological models, even some of the temperance, you know, models, but it basically everything that we've learned has been shoved into um, this one model and it's the biopsychosocial spiritual model. Um, so it basically breaks things down into four categories and this, they apply this to a lot of different um, diseases. Um, but I think it's specifically helpful for addiction because it helps us understand, um, you know, where we need to look, um, for an individual's, uh, risk factors, susceptibilities, causes, and then of course, how we treat them. So, um, the biological is just, you know, the physical way that we work. Psychological is how we think and act. Social is how we interact and bond. And then spiritual is the beliefs and values and how we find meaning and purpose. This is going to be a fun topic. <laughs> I'll start with the easy one for us, and that's the biological. Um, so back in the day, uh, you know, we all saw those uh, awesome commercials where, you know, they'd crack an egg and this is your brain on drugs. Ah! Um, and, you know, there's some truth <laughs> there. There's definitely some truth there, okay? <laughs> um, the problem is, uh, is that that's not the whole truth. It's not, you know, a clear picture. Um, so biologically, we do know that drugs affect your brain. And they actually cause some pretty serious, you know, changes in your brain. Um, the great thing is that most of the time, this is, these are not permanent changes. Um, however, the biological parts contribute to the overall development of addiction. So basically your, um, you know, things that are sort of innate in us to ensure our survival get hijacked by drugs. Um, and uh, so the systems that, you know, reward us for things like sex and food that keep us alive um, get hijacked and actually create this really powerful desire to use, continue to use these drugs. Um, even while they're also doing damage. So it creates, so in the damage that uh, that's being done is being done so in places like your prefrontal cortex which affect your decision making so now uh, whereas you might have been you know able to say gosh you know I don't think I ought to use drugs at this point that'd probably not be a great idea your decision making has become impaired and it now becomes more likely that you'll think that's okay uh, it also affects um, you know, areas of our brain, like the amygdala um, and the, um, oh gosh, <laughs> we'll just go with the amygdala. There's another part of your brain that affects emotions, um, but it, it basically takes over your emotional state. And so you um, develop more impulsivity and compulsivity in using uh, your drugs of choice. Um, it affects your, you know, hypothalamic tracts, which allow uh, proper stress regulation and homeostasis. Um, and, uh, and increase your, you know, desire for these drugs. So basically it becomes kind of a vicious cycle. Um, it also, uh, and this is something that I was talking with, you know, someone before, it also actually causes syndromes similar to depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, personality disorders. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, we'll see people who have had long, um, term addiction issues look like they have these syndromes like major depressive disorder or anxiety disorder um, and they're actually just drug induced disorders um, but this also you know lends to that cycle so the treatment modalities in this area um, basically focus on removing the substance um, 
by removing the substance, your brain starts to heal. And um, it usually takes about one month uh, of sobriety for every year that you use to return to a normal state. Um, the, uh, the unfortunate part is that once these pathways are developed, uh, you basically can fairly easily revert back into those pathways. So even though your brain has healed and may not be using those pathways like it once did, they're still there. And so that's what's led to um, this idea that it's a chronic progressive disease. Um, because once those pathways are laid, um, it's really easy to revert back into uh, the chronic use, even with just after one use, which is kind of and it's strange. Um, so uh, new therapies in this area um, are basically, you know, designed to try to help addicts um, get their brain back into homeostasis um, and, in, and also to minimize withdrawal and cravings. Um, so we have a lot of drugs that are being used like um, naltrexone, gabapentin, ketamine, um, and there's, you know, also a lot of uh, newer treatments that are being used. Uh, one of the ones that I just read about was this uh, electromagnetic wave treatment, um, which is actually, I mean, it sounds kind of, you know, woo-woo, but apparently it has some good data um, behind it. So there's a lot of, um, you know, research and study going on um, trying to target this part uh, of addiction, the biological causes, because um, it, it can be pretty significant. Um, for, uh, for most drugs um, and substance abuse, uh, removing the substance allows brain healing. And after a certain amount of time, people are able to maintain sobriety. Um, there's a caveat to that, and we'll talk about this at the end, but it's opioid-induced um, or opioid addiction. And so that presents a problem in itself um, that we'll just talk about here in a minute. So this is just a little fun fact. I'm gonna skip that because I'm gonna run out of time. Um, so the other part, and this is the keys, the psychological factors. Um, in 1978, there was a, um, a guy who did some experiments who was basically contesting the biological or disease models. And he said that there's gotta be something more. Because so in the past, you know, they'd use these rat models, they'd put them in this box and they'd, you know, isolate them and give them access to all these sorts of drugs. And basically, every rat that they experimented on would just use drugs until they die. That's it. Gave up everything else. And what this guy did was put these rats in a, uh, they called it rat park. <laughs> so he gave them, um, you know, some social interaction and little wheels to play with. And he actually found that uh, those rats didn't develop addiction issues. They were offered the same um, you know, highly addictive drugs, um, and they chose not to do them. They actually continued to, you know, eat and play and have sex and do all sorts of other stuff. And so that, you know, starting in the late 70s really flipped um, our understanding of addiction and has, you know, led us into the kind of current treatments that we see today that we are more familiar with. So sociological stuff, um, this is kind of a subset of the psychological, but basically, uh, you know, we've found that, you know, larger groups do affect, you know, how we, um, our uh, susceptibility to addiction and then uh, how effective treatment programs can be. I didn't realize, man, this has gone fast. So this is the one that gets most of us. And this is where, um, when we start talking about, you know, treatment issues, um, that dreaded S word, the spirituality part. Um, but I, I really hate that, you know, religion has kind of tried to co-opt this because it's, um, it has nothing to do with God. <laughs> it doesn't have to. For some people, obviously it does, um, but it doesn't have to. Um, and, you know, in its broadest sense, this is how we um, develop meaning and purpose in our life. Okay, so that can come from anything, um, which is great news for people who are trying to recover from, you know, an addiction, if that is part of the cause for you. It certainly was for me. You know, I kind of went through that, like, midlife crisis, um, and so, you know, that contributed to, you know, me developing this addiction, and so this was a big part of my treatment, was trying to, you know, redefine 
what I wanted my life to be like, why I would want it that way. So what were my values? What was my purpose and, you know, for being here? And for, you know, initially that the, you know, for a time it was, I just want to get high. I would rather die if I can't use drugs. And, you know, saying that out loud, it's like, wow, that's, that's horrible. <laughs> so, you know, I looking at these things and, and really, you know, getting to talk through them, um, you know, it, it allows uh, a certain level of healing, I think, that uh, I don't like just having, you know, religious people have access to. I don't want secular people to have to ignore this part of it. It's a huge piece. All right. So best treatment programs. Everyone knows there's a gazillion of them right now. Um, and, you know, everyone has a different idea and, you know, about what's, you know, what's best, what we should use, do this, do that, what the causes are, blah, blah, blah. Basically what we found is that um, the best treatment is the one that's effective for that individual. So that's going to look different for everyone. Um, I'm just going to kind of skip ahead, but, you know, one of the problems is that, you know, back in the 1930s, um, this 12-step step program called AA was developed by a couple of guys. Um, and at the time, it was revolutionary. It was great because, remember, it's being compared to asylums, okay? That's all you had. You had AA or the asylum. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> at the time, it was fantastic. Um, the problem with it is, is that it's not run by professionals. It's just, it's a bunch of addicts, which, you know, God bless you. <laughs> um, you know, don't necessarily always know what they're doing. And so, it developed kind of a cult-like following, um, which surprisingly is still, you know, heavily enforced today. I'm required to go to a 12-step program um, as part of my recovery to maintain my medical license, um, which is surprising because you would think that with the information that we have today, especially for physicians, they would recognize that that is one of many ways to recover um, from addiction. Um, but basically the most effective treatment programs are ones that take, that try to treat all four different components of that model that we talked about. So, um, it is important to look at the biological factors. There are certain drugs that are, that do have more of a hook that have, um, you know, that are more difficult to come off of. And that specifically one is, is opioids. So things like morphine, pain pills, uh, heroin, all of those, um, basically when, when you try the abstinence only, um, approach for the biological, these people relapse. It just, it, it fails miserably. There's something different about that specific addiction. Um, and so all of the evidence that we have so far says that medication assisted treatment is better for them. And this is actually what I'm going to be doing in the treatment center, um, is offering medication, um, to help people recover. And this is where a lot, of, a lot of times people get confused. It's like, if I'm taking an opioid, a long acting steady state op opioid, am I recovering? Certainly not sober as we kind of think about it. Um, but these patients, these people do better. They're able to get their lives back. They are no longer, you know, having all of the consequences and the negative side effects um, and they're able to function. So, you know, it can be, this is, you know, one of those debatable topics. Um, but the evidence right now supports the use of medication-assisted treatment for opioid um, disorders, and they're finding that it may actually be um, true for alcohol and benzodiazepines as well. So, um, but some of the other keys is, you know, I would recommend obviously being treated by professionals, um, or at least have some oversight by a professional, either a therapist or you know an addiction medicine psych uh, psychiatrist or specialist, um, just because there's a lot of scams going on. Um, and unfortunately the people, uh, there's a lot of money to be made. So people with insurance and, um, you know, all these new, you know, crazy treatments, there's always somebody there to offer you those treatments and take your money. And there's absolutely no oversight into, um, the effectiveness of some of these things. Man, so we're going to run out of time. All right. So we're going to skip ahead to 
Oh, okay, cool. I was like, yeah, we're going <laughs> to, I just want to make sure that I have time because I know a lot of people probably have questions or things that they want to talk about. Um, so we talked a little bit about, you know, the role of these 12-step um, programs and how, it, and especially in Texas and kind of along the Bible Belt, this is the main, you know, treatment modality that's offered to people. And it works for some people. It works wonderfully. Um, the problem is, is that it doesn't work for everybody. And there's a growing number of people whom, you know, try this method of recovery and fail miserably, either through, you know, continuous relapsing or just, um, you know, they can't seem to, to stick with it. Um, so uh, for us, there's, you know, there's a lot of different programs, but they're not as highly publicized. Um, one of the ones that I found um, was Smart Recovery. Uh, it basically is, um, it's a secular version of, you know, the 12 steps. They don't have all of the higher power stuff, but it does go through, you know, some of the um, psychology and has the, um, the same identification of why you're using it. So I, on one of the previous slides, it, the, the big thing people have to recognize is why you're using it. It's a maladaptive coping mechanism. Um, and so for me, it was... Initially, you know, uh, well, discomfort plus your chemical equals comfort. And you can sub in whatever it is. So anxiety plus my chemical equals relaxation. Um, you know, boring plus my chemical equals fun. Um, and so this, you know, changes and it's different for everyone. But it's important to recognize, like, what that is for each individual. Um, the other thing is that you know, people have to want to change. So if I don't, if I'm not having any sort of consequences or, or you know, pain associated with my use, the likelihood that I'm going to stop using is pretty low. Um, so some of these, uh, you know, programs that we use, like the smart recovery, the rational recovery, they help, um, you know, someone who's addicted think about, the consequences. Think about what's actually happening and try to identify the part that might just be the, you know, brain damage talking versus reality. Because, you know, for a long time, like, I didn't, I didn't recognize what was going on. My brain was telling me that, yeah, this is, this is what I need to be doing. And I couldn't see the consequences actually happening. Um, and so this just kind of helps us, you know, A, recognize, and then B, you know, how to cope. What are some different mechanisms and ways that I can get about this, go about uh, living without it? All right. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, so I've been kind of all over the place, I apologize. But um, there is definitely some stuff that we can do better. Um, the big one, and I think most people here probably know, is it, it decriminalizes. this. The war on drugs has failed. <laughs> it does not work. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and this, you know, the more, you know, other countries that we see doing this, um, watching the success, you know, that they have in actually treating um, addiction and, and lessening the harm that it's done, um, the more I think we realize that, that it's just, this is something that needs to happen. I don't know how that's going to happen other than continuing with things, you know, like education. Um, a lot of schools, you know, have these awareness programs, like we want to make you aware. And so everyone wear camo today so that you can, you know, drugs can't find you. I'm like, what the F is that? Like, <laughs> that is not helping anyone. <laughs> um, so actually having education um, and, you know, kind of like sex education, it's, this is going to be different for everybody, your comfort level about what you should be telling, you know, kids at what age group. Um, but I think, you know, kind of like with sex education, you know, keeping it hidden and, and not telling them anything uh, does a disservice because then it becomes a taboo topic and, you know, experimentation happens and actually, you know, and harm happens because they don't know what to expect. They don't understand, you know, things like um, overdoses and, you know, what's going to happen if I use and they end up driving and just this is where a lot of harm um, that can be avoidable happens. Um, and then, of course, you know, my big thing is uh, 
you know, the acceptance of these non 12 step recovery programs. So I do actually go to AA. Um, and when I first started going, you know, I was just like, Al, I was like, what the hell is wrong with you people? Um, but I found a group uh, that's called We Agnostics, um, and they have a they have a different uh, book that they use. It's um, the Alternative Twelve Steps, and so basically they've just taken out the higher power thing. Because if somebody had told me to make a tree my higher power, I would have been left. <laughs> <I'm> like <laughs> this is ridiculous. Um, but there's still, I think, some stuff, some good stuff that you can get out of these programs. Um, and I think it's a shame to, you know, cut that off. Um, they have, uh, one of the things that I get, you know, that I really enjoy about it is the support network. Um, so we kind of breezed over the socio, the sociological stuff, but having a support network and people that you can talk to, um, that can identify and understand, um, you know, what happened is, is really a big part of being able to recover. Um, and I'd like, you know, it'd be nice if we had other programs that could do that. So, um, and then of course there's all this other stuff like safe consumption and this is where it gets to be really, um, you know, debate is should we be offering clean syringes for people, you know, to use their drugs? Should we be, you know, checking the purity of these drugs? Um, you know, a lot of the deaths that we have are due to fentanyl and carfentanyl overdoses. These are opioid medications that are a thousand times more potent than morphine. So you do just a little bit and you die. Um, and, you know, we don't really have any way to control that right now other than just hope you don't get, you know, that bad batch. Um, they're trying to push things like having naloxone available for people, but that gets into a really, you know, crazy debate as well. All right, so at this point, I'm just gonna open it up for questions, comments, things that you, you know, agree with or disagree with. Yes. Um, can you uh, de-woo a little bit the psychological aspect of uh, giving your problems to a higher power? Like, what is the psychological benefit of doing that? So one of the things that, um, you know, when I talk about that, uh, it's a maladaptive, a maladaptive coping mechanism. Um, but one of the things that happens in that cycle between the psychological and the biological is that uh, we don't want to admit that we have a problem. And we oftentimes, our brains start fooling us into thinking that we don't have a problem and that, oh, we could just stop any time and, you know, whatever. Um, so the first thing that they do is they talk about, you know, you have to acknowledge that you have a problem. Um, the second thing is, what do we do about it at that point? Um, and so for someone who, you know, believes in God or who has religion, um, they find strength and hope in their higher power. Um, psychologically, though, you're basically acknowledging that your brain is not working well, it is telling you to make bad decisions, and I need to listen to somebody else. That's the basis of it. You don't actually have to have a higher power or God telling you what to do. <laughs> you just have to stop doing the same thing that you've been doing. <laughs> so, you know, for me, that looked like, Acknowledging that, you know, my initial instinct is is probably not right. You know, I probably don't need to go out and do a bunch of fentanyl. Um, and so, you know, but I didn't need a tree to take that problem from me and give me advice on how not to do that. <laughs> is that? Yeah. <laughs> then that means that you're passing on your problems to the to God. Whereas the people who are not V is, we don't have that option to pass on our problems to someone else that would be able to take care of our problems. Um, so I think that's probably one of the bigger differences that you would have seen is that you, it's just that people who don't believe in a higher power don't have someone to, there to take, help them with their recovery. It's something I feel like we, we would have issues with. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, so the problem is, is that spirituality has been taken over by, you know, people who equate that with the higher power with God. And, you know, for those of us who don't um, subscribe to that thinking, you know, I find meaning and purpose and values, my values 
in different ways. Like it's, it has nothing to do with, you know, what's right, um, you know, stated by religion. It has much more to, I'm a secular humanist. Um, so it has much more to do with, you know, my values are, are based on other humans. And there's different ways to think about it. I mean, you know, accepting that I'm powerless over my, you know, ability to use drugs and alcohol, um, you know, they compare it to like, I'm, uh, you know, there are things that are more powerful than me, mother nature, uh, you know, the universe. Um, and so it's just, you know, identifying that like, I don't control everything. Um, and that's kind of, for me, the take home from all of that is that um, there are some things that I don't have control over. So my ability to use drugs safely is one of those things that I just have to accept. I'm wondering if the uh, pathways that get developed in your brain that support addiction, are those fairly universal? For example, if you are addicted to nicotine and can't stop smoking, are you very likely to become a very fast drug addict also? Not necessarily. I mean, they do tend to go together. And so these days, you know, especially we see, you know, with polysubstance use disorder, um, because uh, those tracks, you know, all of them share dopamine in common. So they all affect that reward pathway. Um, but each drug kind of also has its own um, subset. So like with opioids, it affects that, you know, endogenous opioid system. Um, and, and we see a lot of different um, uh, characteristics, you know, overlapping, but then also, you know, unique to the particular drug. Psychologically, though, um, I think that's true. I think that if you're using drugs, and so it's the maladaptive, you know, coping mechanism, then, you know, of course, you'd be open to utilizing lots of other drugs, you know. So, I mean, I think certainly from that standpoint, you know, it, 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 can, it can be similar. So you've been through this and um, know a little bit about it more than other people who are just giving talks on the, the information itself. What advice would you give for the family and friends who are on the outside of someone experiencing this? What can they do to help or make things better or ease things? Um, so I think the, the biggest thing that initially held me back from getting help was the stigma. Um, there's a lot of shame associated with, um, you know, being an addict. Um, and it, it was one that I, I really wasn't prepared to take on. I did not want that label. Um, and so it stopped me from getting help earlier on. So my friends, you know, that were concerned about me, you know, and noticing like, hey, oh my God, you're really having a problem. This is kind of getting out of hand. You know, I'm like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> You know, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want that to be a problem for myself. So certainly, you know, not normalizing it, but just having an acceptance of, yep, this happens and um, it's going to be okay. You know, we there there are ways, you know, for you to get your life back and for you to get treated. Um, and then, of course, I was lucky. I mean, at the time that I figured out that I had a problem, I knew where to go. So you have a lot of problem, you know, a lot of people who realize that they're addicts, but they don't know what to do at that point. They know that they can't beat it on their own, um, but they, you know, either don't have insurance or don't know where to go. They don't want to go to their church group or whatever, you know. So there's kind of limited access. So I think, you know, knowing where to, you know, refer people, some places that they can go, and I'll, you know, give resources um, after this, but there's a lot of really great treatment facilities and places, you know, that you can send friends and family or, you know, have references. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, and then, you know, the, the follow-up is that once somebody is in recovery and actually trying, um, it's really, it's hard knowing how to support that person. I had a lot of people who are kind of like, you know, what do I do now? You know, like, is it okay to drink in front of you? Or, you know, like, I mean, there's just a lot of, you know, and, and a lot of it is just about having that openness and removing the shame so that you can talk to people about what they need and, because it's going to look different for, you know, everybody. Um, so really just, you know, uh, being willing to talk about it with people, being more open to, you know, 
finding out what it means for that individual, um, and then just trying to be as non-judgmental as possible um, to support whatever it is that they need, you know, to get better. Uh, so getting back to the S, in, <laughs> um, I, I'm curious if you think that it would help uh, recovering addicts who are secular uh, to either re rename the spiritual component, like is it, would that be, is that something you're advocating for? Um, so yes, so, and like, you know, the work of Sam Harris, um, you know, is, there's a lot of different people trying to kind of reclaim some of this for us because it, it really is, it's just an important part of life, you know, developing meaning and purpose. It's like why we're here. Um, and yes, so there's, you know, for some people just kind of relabeling it helps a great deal. Um, and so not calling it spirituality, but just talking about mindfulness or we're going to use some meditation techniques or, you know, we're going to talk about your values and, you know, what you want your life to look like and why you think you're here. You know, basically any, yeah, I mean, it's going to look different for everybody, but any way that you can start bringing that back into conversations with people, I think is helpful. Yeah, I just I really wanted to thank you for bringing up this topic. This is an important topic. Um, personally, a lot of people here already know that I'm in private recovery. I don't participate in any group anymore, but I've been clean for about six years. But um, I did need the groups, and I was in the rooms for a couple of years. And it's very difficult to be a non-believer in AA. They say the Our Father. They say the you know um, Serenity Prayer. They you know. The, they call the, you know, the A book the big book, but the Bible is the big, big book. And um, God is all over that room, and there's an enormous amount of pressure. And um, I was first exposed to the rooms when I was a teenager, but didn't join because of not being a believer. And I, you know, kind of crawled back in in my early 20s, and again, just couldn't accept the steps. And um, when I finally crawled into the rooms, like in the late 20s, I, I really could have died many times over, over that period of time that I was out there. And I have a chip on my shoulder about the fact that there isn't a place for people that need help, you know, and, and don't believe. And um, I just wanted to speak out about this because I want to say that if you know someone who's in you know the atheist community that's struggling they're doubly struggling because um they kind of are at a catch-22 the only place to get the best support you really are kind of um i mean after the big welcoming ceremony the first couple months you really are put under an enormous amount of pressure to change your beliefs or essentially you're not going to succeed you're given that and so i um just encourage people to support and and know that um you know we need the support even more in the atheist community Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. That's actually, so the clinic that I'm hoping to be able to join Clean Slate, um, you know, is a secular <laughs> based organization um, that actually focuses on providing medication assisted treatment for people who, you know, have addiction to opioids or alcohol. Um, and they want to serve as a uh, kind of a facilitator to point people in the right directions to make sure that they're getting, you know, adequate psychological help and um, support, you know, help them build support networks, whatever that may look like for the individual. Um, and that's really what I think treatment needs to focus on is, is, you know, I'm not saying get rid of, you know, A or whatever, but certainly it is not for everyone. And there has to be, you know, um, options for, you know, all different types of people, Buddhists, you know, Muslims, whatever. I mean, those those guys also don't do well um, with the traditional 12-step. Yeah, um, I just, okay. <laughs> I'm going to try to keep this short, um, but I'll start out with uh, on October 15th, 1995, I called the suicide hotline. Suicide hotline go, told me to go to a meeting. I picked up a white key tag at Narcotics Anonymous, and I've never used since then. Um, I am also an atheist, uh, and it is very difficult, but there's a s couple things that I've discovered, and I would love to talk to you afterwards, um, about the program and different ways to look at the program, and I've sponsored many people, um, in an atheist, uh, modality, um, but, uh, two things, one, I want to talk about the tree, 
um, because there's actually, when I was really new, um, there was a guy, I don't know if I'm actually telling this as an anecdote of somebody else that they made up, but I'll pretend like it really happened. Um, but there was a guy coming to the meeting and he had this tree that he would drive by every day um, that he would pray to on the way to work. And so he's, he's doing really well. He's getting about six months clean. And all of a sudden, one day, he runs into the meeting with, in a panic, in a panic. And everyone's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he's like, I'm going to relapse. I'm going to relapse. I'm like, what happened? He says, they cut down my God. So, um, but I, one of the things that, that this has been very educational and very cerebral, um, the difficult the difficulty that I find uh, in the community is that addiction is generally an emotional problem. Um, we have trouble regulating our emotions, our amygdala, um, our midbrain, and uh, and we can all talk very you know very in intelligently about it um, until we're having a feeling, <laughs> and then it's like, oh yeah, nicotine, caffeine, sugar, heroin. Um, you know, something to change the way that I feel because I'm highly uncomfortable. Um, so, great topic, and uh, I guarantee you if we talked for years, we could never tell you everything, um, and she did a great job kind of covering the basics, and I will talk to you afterwards. Awesome. Yeah, if you don't I mean, mind. No, absolutely. I'm so excited like to, you know, it's amazing, you know, when you kind of come out of the closet that you're an addict, how many people also have, you know, some similar issues. And, you know, it sounds like you're kind of similar to me and that we're pretty strong, um, highly vocal people. We don't have problems in 12-step programs. I'll I'm like, you can tell me all day long, like what you believe and that's great for you, but I'm going to talk about, you know, my atheism and how this works for me. And so, you know, we just have different, um, ways of dealing with it, but certainly it can be a huge problem for people who aren't as strong willed. I know there are a couple of more questions, but we are completely out of time, <laughs> but I am going to jump the line because, and, and ask about this because, um, I know there's a lot of marijuana users in the group. Where does marijuana fit into I this? I didn't even get to I mean, I mean, because seriously, because it's becoming legalized in many in many yes. states. And so this goes, I can't believe I forgot my last slide. But this is where, you know, a lot of the questions, you know, come up. Because one of the big, you know, contributors to the opioid crisis is the pain management issue in our country. And so now, you know, they're talking about, you know, is marijuana a safer choice and should it be used? And I think right now the answer is yes. <laughs> I want to caution people that, like, there's some a lot of caveats to this, but we don't often see people um, develop the addiction that we're used to seeing with strictly marijuana. So we'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Lisa, what's going on with the kids back there? Thank you, Dr. Way. You know, I think that's incredibly brave of you, Megan, to, to come up before your community and, and tell such a personal story is very much appreciated. I know there are those here who have gone through similar things and are struggling now. Um, and so I, I hope it's okay that if we encourage people to just hit your inbox. And so uh, so those of you that want to talk about addiction from, a, from uh, whether it affects you or someone you love, please reach out to Megan privately. <laughs>